here, back in Hancock County with so many friends. I mean, truthfully, it is pretty amazing to come back to a county that I know I, I won last year in both the primary and the general election. So, so my very first thing I have to say to all of you is thank you. Because in a, in a year that was a very tough year, that in many ways was a perfect storm for Republicans across the country and here in Maine, we, in, you here in Hancock County, showed something a little bit different. It wasn't perfect. We didn't get everything we wanted. But I want to say thank you for all that you did. And the examples that you set and the things you did in 2014 are things that all of us in all the counties across the state can learn from as we head into the next election cycle. And that leads me to my first order of business, which is some specific thank yous. I particularly want to thank John and Pam. I want to thank my, my former colleagues, both Ralph and Ted, who are just wonderful leaders for our state and for our region. Uh, and I'm so appreciative to be here with you guys tonight. So again, thank you so much. You know, I travel the state a lot. And it's really interesting as I stand here before you today, when we think about what's happening right now. You know, this time last night, well, maybe about 9 o'clock last night, my husband got home and he wanted to watch the GOP presidential debate. This is a true story. And Danny turned on the television and he said, I got home a couple hours later. He said, Emily, I turned on the TV because I thought it started at 9. And what I realized was, you know, I thought I was watching Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and then I realized I did actually have it on the right channel. And <laughs> And it was the actual GOP presidential debate. And then, you know, you open the papers this week and you see our congressman, Bruce Poliquin, twice being the subject of the editorial cartoon by George Stanton. Not once, but twice in the same week for bad choices and poor leadership. You know, we're at a place where we're watching the government down in Washington have a debate about whether or not the government's gonna shut down over something that is not even a problem when it comes to the question of whether or not women should be able to make their own health care decisions. And we're talking about Planned Parenthood. That's just ridiculous that our government right now is having that, that debate. And you know, you'd think, gosh, you know, if it weren't real, if it weren't something that we're probably going to read about again tomorrow, that maybe it was just a, a bad dream, or maybe it was some kind of terrible movie that you find on late night television, but it's real and it's scary. And you know, in, in all of this, as we look at jobs at risk in Bangor because of the export import bank, and again, the failure of Bruce Policy to show leadership when it comes to what's best for our district. When we look at the stat statistics you were, just saw over the last hour, and I saw only the end of that presentation, but how much opportunity is out there for us to change how we get our energy, where it comes from, so that we have a better outcome for ourselves, for our pocketbooks, and most of all, for the next generation of generations to come. And really, as I think about the craziness, and maybe there's words for it, maybe we call it crazy town, maybe we call it pandemonium, maybe we call it chaos, I'll tell you what keeps me grounded. As I stand before you running again for Congress now in the second district, it's the people that I meet. It's the fact that two weeks ago, I was out in Auburn and I sat on the back of a pickup truck for an hour with a young veteran who talked to me about the challenges he and his peers have had when it comes to PTSD or trying to find work and making sure our young veterans are getting the training they need so that they can enter the workforce and be successful and support their family and our older veterans, that they get the health care that they deserve and that they've earned every single time. It's about the seniors that I meet at the grocery store. I admittedly only go to the grocery store in the last half hour it's open, or well, the first half hour it's open, are the only times of day I can get there. But it seems like a very popular time of night for some main seniors to be there too, or early in the morning. And I end up in the line talking with my neighbors about, as it's 80 degrees outside, about the challenges of heating our homes this winter. It's 80 degrees outside. But Maine seniors are worried about how are they going to heat their homes all winter, and I bet some of you are too. 
It's about the small businesses I've been able to tour this summer and fall. It's about the farmers that I meet who want to make sure whether they're the big potato growers up in Aroostook County or they're the organic farmers that you might see at our local <laughs> farmer's market on the weekend, that the climate will be there for what they need it to be there for them to cook and grow their products and bring them to market. And that we're going to be able to get that local food into our markets and have it processed here in our state. The things that keep me going, not the craziness, it's the real people that I meet every single day. And by contrast, when we look at what's happening right now with Bruce Poliquin, what's he making headlines for? Bruce Poliquin is making headlines for being the number two recipient of Wall Street money in the entire Congress. He hasn't even been there a year yet, and that's the kind of list that he's topping. He's also being excited to vote for the House Republican budget that cut Pell Grants. Cut Pell Grants at a time when I have students in my office every single day who are doing internships with us, but also working and going to class because they know that the, that the debt that could face them after they graduate could be overwhelming. And Bruce Pollock is voting for a budget and excited for it that cuts Pell Grants. We've also watched him be excited for that same budget that cut Medicare. And that's not okay either. We've watched him stand up as the only anti-choice member of Maine's delegation. That's terrible for Maine women and Maine families. We've watched him stand up as the only anti-marriage equality member and campaign on that in the last election of Maine's entire congressional delegation. We've seen him accept money from the Koch brothers, vote for the Keystone XL pipeline, and have more money from PACs than from people on his financial reports every single quarter. And by contrast, I stand before you today with a campaign that is bigger and better and stronger. And I don't just mean the fact that I have a new hairdo. And I know some of you are thinking about that. I'll tell you, I travel the state. I think I'm gonna get questions about why you're running again, what's happening, what are you doing with your time, where have you been, and people say, Emily, it's so great to see you. I'm so glad you're running. Have you changed your hair? <laughs> and the answer is yes, I have. Yeah, I absolutely have, and you know what? That's not the only thing that's different about this campaign. Rest assured. Right now I stand before you today with more than 250 names on my endorsement list from people in the second district. More than 45 current and former state legislators from the second districts have signed their names to that list too. We've had endorsements from local labor unions. We've had endorsements from former Congressman Tom Allen just this week. And I'll remind you, Tom Allen was the last member in Maine to defeat an incumbent when he was elected to Congress. In 1996, he beat Congressman Longley in order to, to win that first district seat. He knows what it's like, and he's been encouraging me every step of the way. Shelly Pingree supports our campaign, and the overwhelming <laughs> support we've had across the district is why we're getting such support from the national level, too. Emily's List has come back with a full endorsement of our campaign. The National uh, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the organization focused on picking up seats to take back the House in Congress, they're backing us, too. And that's leading to national support from labor unions. We're also looking at other national endorsements that we're going to be rolling out very soon. But the endorsements we're getting, they're not just because I served 10 years in the legislature and because I have very good experience at the table. They're because I've been able to demonstrate the support across the district already. Two years ago, I met a lot of you for the first time, and I didn't have lists like that. Today, some of your names are on those lists. I hope more of you will join today. I've got a sign-up sheet that we're passing around. But let's be clear, this race isn't just a top priority for Maine. It isn't just important to us that Bruce Poliquin no longer be our member of Congress. What's important is that this district represents really, it really represents the tip of the spear. It's the first, one of the top two or three priorities for Democrats in the entire country. And I don't have to look to Democrats to tell me that. Because the National Republican Committee and the U.S. Chamber of Congress, they, excuse, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, excuse me, they both list Bruce Baldwin as one of the top five most vulnerable members in Congress. And I couldn't agree with them more. My focus 
every single day between now and the election is doing everything I need to do to win this seat for the people of Maine. To take it back from Wall Street and bring it back to Main Street. So that every day we are able to tell the stories of the Mainers that you know, that are your neighbors, that are my neighbors, that I have met in all of the counties across this district over the last two years, over the last six months, and for me, many years to come. This is a time when Democrats in Maine have to be united. Next year, we have an opportunity we cannot afford to miss. We have a presidential year, and good news, we live in a district that has gone for the Democratic candidate for president every single time since 1992. This is a district that elected Barack Obama both times. This is a district where next year, I mean, as much as last year was really fun, having all those big races, we don't have a governor's race next year. You might wish we did. Actually, now that I look at your faces, I saw a face over here. Boy, you looked really sad when I said that. I'm sorry, there's no governor's race next year, but there's also no Senate race next year, which means after the presidential race, Maine's second congressional district, without question, will be not only a top race for our state, but across the country. We will pick up seats in the legislature. We have to pick up seats in the state legislature. We have to win back this seat. This seat is important not only to Mainers. It's important to the entire country. It's important to the direction you want to see Congress go. It's important as to whether or not you want a member of Congress who listens to you or listens to whoever's writing the biggest check. For me, it's all about people. In fact, I'll tell you a funny number. I make a lot of calls and we get a lot of mail and people send checks to, to support the campaign. It's really wonderful. Um, Pam's got one in her hand right there. Thank you, Pam. And I'll tell you, I was shocked. Today, I just happened to ask my one of my staff, I said, hey, how many donors have we had this, this time around this year? He said, Emily, it's 2,556. I said, 2,556 people. He said, yeah, and it's growing every single day. And his email popped up, he said, we just got one more. This is the kind of campaign we're running. This campaign's gonna look different, it's gonna feel different. It's gonna feel different because it's gonna be stronger, it's gonna be bigger, and you know what? In the last election, I'll be clear. There were a lot of hits that Bruce Poliquin took at me that went unanswered because they were late, because they were awful, because they were so untrue and so unconscionable really. But this time not a single one will go unanswered. Because you're gonna hold them accountable, I'm gonna hold them accountable to the truth, to the facts, and to making sure that every single time that the people of Maine have the final say. That this is 100% about what's best for Maine, because what's best for Maine is absolutely what's best for our country. That's the kind of leadership you deserve. It's the kind of leadership we've come to expect. And you know, it's not fun to lose. Last year, I woke up the day after the election, I didn't know how I would feel, but I'll tell you how I felt. I woke up caring just as much about the people of the state of Maine and the future of our state as I had the day before. And I believe that it is when you lose, when life can't do something that you wouldn't expect or you weren't going for, that when you lose, it's not the loss that defines you, it's what comes next. And that's why every single day, between now and the next election, I'm gonna be working and I'm asking you tonight to join me. I want every single one of you on my team. Because really, I can't do it without you. And it's that important that we all have to do it together. So thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I know you've been here for a little while. Um, but I want to make sure I answer anything you want to know. Uh, and I'm really pleased and so grateful to be here tonight. Thank you. And I hope you'll find out for my endorsement. Thank you so much. Where I stand on the environment, um, having earned endorsements in the last election from Elsie.